Welcome to the Scale Up Valley podcast, where we bring the best of the best to help you scale your business from 1 million to 1 trillion. Today's guest is Alvin, CEO at Hallyu. Uh, Alvin, welcome to the show. A pleasure to have you here. Thank you so much for having me, guys. Uh, and yeah, well, let's get to know more uh, about you. This episode is part of the special season, uh, the Asian edition that covers uh, entrepreneurs from the Southeast Asia uh, region and really yeah. love having to do sure. this as one of our co-founders is also based in, in Malaysia. And uh, <laughs> but, but just to give context for the ones who are listening to the episode for the first time and yeah, let us know more about 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 you, Alvin. You have an amazing yeah. story, and and about <laughs> your vision with uh, with all you. Yeah, thank you so much. Like I probably would just introduce myself and my company. So hi guys, uh, you know, really pleasure to be here with Scale Up Valley. Uh, my name is Alvin E. I'm co-founder and CEO of uh, Holio. Uh, you know, the interesting thing about my story is that I am actually uh, when I was just 25 years old, I started my own trucking business. Uh, you know. Why would a random guy start a trucking business? Essentially, because uh, my father is in logistics for over 30 years. So yeah. I'm kind of like a second generation business owner. Uh, oh, that my family business does logistics. Um, it's quite in my family DNA, fortunately or unfortunately. Sometimes I ask my dad, you know, why don't you do something sexier, like you know, in banking or insurance, you know? <laughs> yeah, because I actually studied finance. Uh, but I well basically because I think you know for the listeners out here um, in, in Southeast Asia or in Asia or in Chinese you know it's quite a thing for filial you know filial piety I'm the eldest son uh, of three sons two younger brothers and I you know I kind of like saw my father I grew up seeing my father you know working so hard building a business that he was just a he used to be a truck driver and today he's a boss of you know, 100 over trucks, right? And, and I think it's quite impressive. He has a warehouse, you know, wow. it's, it's, a, it's, it's quite a good, you know, business, I guess. And I, I, I just, as the eldest son, I just thought that, you know, I was actually looking for a job. So the funny thing, guys, is that he <laughs> gave, he actually liked me into, into joining the business because I was actually looking back then, 10 years ago, you know, you know investment banking and all, it's kind of like the cool thing, right? I see all my smartest friends joining the IBs, you know, in the financial world, I, I graduated in, in Australia, actually, with a finance uh, degree. So I did an internship uh, as an auditor in KPMG, uh, but I know for sure I don't want to be an auditor. So I couldn't find a job. And I, I basically went back to help my father. Uh, and he said that, you know, you just, you know, come back and work here first, you know, and then you can find a job after or something like that. That was the biggest lie he told me, man, guys. <laughs> so when I joined, right, I basically <laughs> fell in love <laughs> with supply chain. Because I, I saw so much, you know, traditional, archaic, manual stuff, you know. And I started my own trucking business to support my father. And uh, he was my first customer, actually. So I decided to do something a little bit different. So Holio, that, that, and the story essentially is how it led to Holio's formation, is that I, I uh, you know, container haulage for, the, uh, for those guys who are listening here. If you guys have seen the, the movie Transformers, Right, you know, there's this right. thing called the Optimus Prime, <laughs> right? So the Primer is, is, this, is, this, is this really cool truck, right? That goes into the ports and pick up the containers, right? From the ports and deliver those containers to the warehouses for unloading. So, you know, for the commoners, right? We are kind of like the inter rim between, you know, ocean and land, right? 90% mm -hmm. of global trade guys is actually on, on, on ships, Right, containerization only started in the 1950s and that really transformed global trade. So global trade today is a 9.7 trillion US dollars industry and growing you know, tremendously. Supply chain is basically anything that moves, but 90% of them are actually moved on a ship. And these are usually moved in containers. So there are millions of containers that are you know, transacting and, and moving around the world as we speak. Right, so this is the space that we are in. So Holio stands for haulage in overdrive. Right. So haulage mm -hmm. is essentially the movement of containers from port to warehouse and to the depots. So if, if you guys buy things online, right, you know, you can see this. Uh, basically, we replace parcels with containers. Right. The, the, the parcel essentially is just a, an item, a packaging that puts the things in the package. Right. Mm -hmm. And the container is a, is a huge form of that that has a lot of these raw materials and finished mm -hmm. goods that are actually, if you look around you guys today, if you are listening, 
right? I can dare to get, tell you that a lot of things that you see around you have been in the container before. So it is a, it's a massive industry and it's hidden, right? So, well, essentially I grew my trucking business from one truck to 15 trucks for the first three years of my business. And in my fifth year of doing that, uh, I met my co-founder. Actually, the interesting story, again, for Holio is that Holio was actually founded by a non-industry guy, Sebastian. <laughs> Sebastian is my co-founder. Right? He came to me in 2017, January. Uh, I met him for the first time through a common friend. And when he pitched to me the idea of Uber for container trucks, you know, uh, which is essentially what Holio stands for, right? The, the vision of that. I actually said no to him. I said that. Mm, I don't think it will work because I, 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 I was very deep into the business, right? And I've been doing this for quite a while myself. I know there are huge problems there. And I asked myself, why did I tell him that it didn't work? Because I went back home because we, we, we said goodbye, right? We parted ways and I went home and for two weeks, I can't really sleep well because I've been asking me this question. What happens if this guy is right? right? If he is right, actually, then I would think that there's this issue of existential crisis. Like I wouldn't exist anymore as a physical trucking company owner. And that's the reason why I resisted in the first place. And I, and I, and I asked myself, like, what happens if this were to succeed? And, I, and I, I said, instead of letting others disrupt myself, how about I disrupt myself? Exactly. <laughs> <You know? laughs> So that was what we are all about. So Holio, uh, you know, for one liner, you know, I think this is a global, we are, we are Uber for container trucks. I think for lack of, I mean, for Southeast Asia, right? So we are Grab. I think if you guys know Grab, we are, we are Grab for container trucks. Yeah. And the vision is to connect Southeast Asia to the world. We want to have all containers within Southeast Asia to be transacted on our platform. And so that any, you know, any of these customers who need to haul a container anytime, anywhere, you know, at the guaranteed fulfillment price, we are able to service them for that. So it's, it's a basically the concept it's uh you know in the past we need to own a lot of assets to run these trucks right we are basically trying to be a robin hood here aggregate all of these trucks physically onto our platform digitally we become the largest trucking operator in southeast asia so that's really what holio is about and they are specific trucks guys i, I remind you guys once again it's the prime movers and the optimus primes that you see <laughs> love it Amazing, amazing story. Uh, I had the opportunity to read your uh, Father's you. Day article uh, you where so you much. explain a little bit uh, the story. <laughs> so uh, it's, it's a great one. I really recommend. What was the outlet or the media channel where you have, of uh, course, people can was, go into your LinkedIn uh, as well? Uh, yeah, you can you can check me out on LinkedIn as well. Uh, but it's actually a Tatler Asia uh, publication. Yeah. Uh, they invited me to, to speak about my relationship with my father. To be honest, guys, that article was beautifully written. But there are a lot of negative things that I had to say about my dad that I couldn't write because it's Father's Day. <laughs> <laughs> well, well then. <laughs> and and I, I really love the, the last part. I think it was on the post uh, or even in the article. That... Yeah things that we are not we don't have the courage to say to our parents uh, <laughs> to our fathers yeah, right so it's very true they're kind yeah. of very simple i love you but uh, yeah. that's something that we takes a lot enough. of courage to yeah, uh, yeah to i mean it. it's a guy to guy thing right guys my exactly. family has five five people and like four guys and one woman which is my mom like half love and guys we don't say like i love you bro you know we don't do that <laughs> things, right? i love you dad <laughs> Exactly, it resonated uh, with me, and was it was nice to yeah. to, to read it. And um, yeah, what what is the gap be, uh, between where you are today with all you and where you want to be uh, in the future with uh, with all you? Yeah, good question. I think the the gap is actually is always about timing, right? And uh, you know, for for two and a half years, you know, COVID hit us, and I, I felt that we couldn't do much. So Holio essentially, we are headquartered in Singapore. We're actually invested very thankfully, you know, very blessed to be invested by one of the largest port operators in the world in PSA. Uh, so PSA is obviously it used to stand for port of, port of Authority of Singapore, but they are now an international and global port uh, business. Got they it. have ports over China, you know, in America, in Europe, in Antwerp, you know, in Southeast Asia, in Thailand and Indonesia as well. So we wanted to expand our coverage ASAP. Right, that was really what we were supposed to do. But I think COVID hit us, you know, we, we started our business really only in 2018, like for two years, I was traveling a lot, 
you know, trying to suss out the ground. I think this is kind of like quite a bit of a political business, right? You got to handle the ports, authorities, you know, it, it, it's a little bit mafia, right? If you use, you use that word Italian mafia, right? Uh, if you <laughs> step, if you do something wrong, you offend the wrong person before you even start in a new country, you are dead. So I think I was sort of sussing on the ground, trying to figure out how different college is like in different countries. Like, to be honest, guys, like the process behind it is really straightforward. You just, you just have the Optimus Prime, go to the port, pick up a container, you know, get out, send to the customer. And once it, they are you know, done with the container, you return it to, to the depot, right? How complex is that? But I, I kind of realized that every single market, even within a certain, certain country, they have different terminal systems. They have seen that certain different kind of a hyper-localized workflow that is uniquely different. So that was the gap I was trying to figure out and suss out the market. But in the moment I was ready to go in 2020, then you guys know what happened, right? Boom, you know, COVID hit us. We, we couldn't travel. You know, that was the biggest gap. And I think, thankfully, fingers crossed, I think life is coming back to normalcy now in Southeast Asia, guys. And I think the, the world is opening up. Um, I'm traveling almost. I think, I think Mike was trying to get me for a while now. So I was thankful that I managed to get onto the show. I was in Thailand last week. I'll be in Thailand again next week. A lot of traveling now. I think the gap now essentially is how do we then start again? You know, I think we, we survived as a, as a startup. I think that was very important for most startups. And I think we'll probably talk about that in details later on. But the gap essentially now is how do we then scale up very quickly? We are very thankful to have the blessings of we close off our Series A end of last year. So we're at this stage where we are literally scaling up. My company grew from, I think, 50 packs and now we're at 82 and counting. No, we, are, we are growing massively quickly now and really trying to, you know, get ourselves in every, the rest of Southeast Asia. So Holly is in Singapore, Thailand, and Indonesia today. Uh, we mm-hmm. hope to be in three other markets by end of next year, uh, namely Malaysia, Vietnam, and Philippines. Got it. It's, it's almost uh, all, all the markets uh, in the region. Yeah, that's the, that's the plan. Yeah, that's why we are the grab, right? So the, 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 the idea is there. We want to make sure that we are hyper-localized and I think speed is of the essence today, right? There are many trucking platforms uh, coming out. I think digitalization becomes, well, the best thing, well, I mean, no, COVID was not good, right? But the best thing that came out of COVID was that it accelerated a lot of the need for digitalization, right? Simple yeah. things like, you know, my industry is really old school, man, guys. Like they don't know how to use computers, guys. Like when, in the past, in 2019, if I were to meet a port operator in Thailand, you know what they tell me? Can you please fly in and meet me in the office for one hour? And I flew all the way there, traveled all the way down two hours journey down to Lam Chabang, go to the port, meet them one hour, I had to go back. You know why? Because that's the way they do business. Right. right? And now with COVID, actually, if it's just for one hour, I could actually so say right that, can, we, can yeah. we just do it over Zoom, please? <laughs> yes. You know, at, at least they know what Zoom, guys. Like they know Zoom, they know how to log on, they know how to do that. So I think little things like that, you know, shaped a little bit in terms of way businesses are done. But of course, caveat, I think in Southeast Asia or in this part of the world, you can never take away the face-to-face. I think that's really important you know, ingredient of success. And that's something that you know, my, myself and my team personally are flying out all over to sort of, and I think there's this rebound effect, guys. Like people love to see each other now. I think there's like this, this, this old right. feeling of like being together again, you know, the face-to-face Getting interaction. <laughs> Yeah, I would love to see you in person, Mike. And I think, guys, Likewise. the interesting thing about in Zoom is that you never know how tall the person is. I was absolutely <laughs> shocked when I see some people and I've been speaking to them for two years over Zoom or, or Skype for the, or, 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 or Teams for the matter. And I see them in person like, dude, you look way taller than you're supposed to be. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Great point. <laughs> And, and that's great because with uh, Vietnam, Philippines, and Malaysia, of course, you already covered the largest market in Southeast Asia, um, Indonesia, but, uh, but with Vietnam and Philippines, uh, those are also big, very big markets in the region. Uh, Malaysia, smaller one, uh, but uh, very developed. Uh, so any considerations on the size of the markets and how difficult it is also to penetrate some of these markets, oh. right? Guys, Southeast Asia is a tough nut to crack. Like I, I absolutely salute Grab and a lot of the other, you know, I think Ninja Van is one of the other ones that has really successfully kind of like cracked. Uh, I took a lot of inspiration from uh, Changwon and Ninja Van, right? Uh, is that they basically wanted to, you know, five years ago or four years ago, their, their vision statement was very clear. They wanted to make sure that any parcel, any, anytime, anywhere, 
in Southeast Asia, they can get it delivered. So for me, right, guys, sometimes you just don't, you just do what works, right? So I just replace the word parcel with containers and that is all, boom. <laughs> so wow. I want to be able to send any container, any place, anywhere in Southeast Asia. So when that is in mind, it's part of the, the, it's really about coverage right now. And I think you talk about markets, right? Well, the interesting thing that I think, I've spoken with a lot of VCs before, and they, in their heads, I mean, in a, in, a, in a consumer world, of course, right? I mean, it's the largest market, right? 200 over million people, population size, blah, blah, blah. But if you think about it, right, actually from a port perspective, the number one market is actually in Thailand. They have the highest throughput, which is around 11.5 million containers, right? Got when it. we say throughput, meaning to say that the ports are actually transacting, and because Thailand is actually a massive exporter for cars, a lot of automotive you know, vehicles are actually built and assembled oh, yes. in Thailand itself. So whereas in Indonesia, actually their numbers is somewhere below the range of 9 million TUs. So contrary to popular belief, right? People yeah. are asking me like, why are you in Thailand first? I mean, obvious caveat is because PSA, our one of our most strategic investors, has terminals in Thailand and Indonesia. So we don't, well, I think people asking why a certain place, you know, why do you go these places? I think natural reaction to this is you don't go there for the sake of being there, right? You know, from a startup founder to another founder, it's that you've got to know why you're there. And for us, it makes perfect sense because PSA has certain influence, right? It gives me some anchor positioning when I'm a random young boy coming into Thailand, right? But because you have PSA's backing, right? They have a terminal there for you to sort of do simple pilots, they have some level of influence, you know, they can get you to convince some truckers to come on board. So these are really important decision-making uh, thought framework that I have before I decide to launch into a market. And we do a lot and lots of pilots first before we say that I'm going to be there. And I think these are things that we, we got to evaluate as well. I think the vision is clear, but whether or not you want to be, I've been eyeing Indonesia since 2018 but i think of course there are a lot of trucking platforms out there that has faced significant more amount of money so every step that i take i had to be very cautious in fact guys i only launched in indonesia after covid 2022 only this year nice. april i was there because you know we we found a, a good time as well i think a lot of the trucking platforms during covid they really struggled to because guys the reality is that when covid hit everybody your industry, the trucking industry, the supply chain folks, they have other more important things to do, right? Rather than try to test out something new because this is exactly something new for them. So they have different priorities. And I think, well, it was timely that my investors actually told me to just, Elvin, just make sure you survive, please. Like the next, when COVID happened, <laughs> just, just think about survival. So as, as founders as well, for me, I feel blessed because I think I have very strategic corporate investors on my cap table. I mean, not to this, not to say about the rest that we have we, VCs that have different priorities, you know, and things like that. But I think it was about survival, and survival we did. Uh, it was two and a half difficult years, right, for most founders. And, and I think right now, at yeah. least, you know, we are coming back up. This is a good point, and and please, for the ones who don't understand very well the the space, so how does the business model work? Sure. Uh, what is kind of the value position for all yeah, years yeah. and ship, shippers as yeah. you have in your, yeah. your website? Yeah. Sure. When I say Uber for trucks, right, or, or, or Grab for the matter, right, most people will take us like a marketplace, right? So uh, I just need to explain that our fundamental business model is we are actually a digital trucking company, right? The concept essentially is we are, we are non-ownership, right? The operating model. So we are basically a digital main contractor, that has many physical subcontractors that we aggregate on our platform. And we, well, guys, the ultimate thing is that last time in the previous generation, in the, the 2.0 era, right, people own assets. Why do, why do I own trucks in the past? I own trucks so that I can get my drivers so that I have control. I can tell the drivers exactly where to go because I employ them under my payroll, right? So guy, uh, driver number one, please go to this location and pick up this container and deliver it to this, con this location by this time. So that was the old way of thinking, right? I think with the, with the innovation of Uber or Airbnb business models coming in, well, the, 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 the most people will just assume that in, in, in trucking, if it works for Uber, it works for trucks as well, right? But actually, guys, my business is actually a scheduled business. If you guys know how planes work, right? You, you have to board a certain plane, you have to follow a certain process, but if the plane arrives late, it's the same thing. You replace the plane with ships and these ships, the passengers are all containers, right? And these containers can arrive late. 
So it, it's actually a scheduled business. It's not really on demand per se. So our business model is being a very big trucking company, right? Digital one, we provide, um, you know, higher technology in terms of how we can manage. It's just kind of a managed marketplace per se. We are able to then using data points to then assign the best container to the best haulier or, 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 or the prime mover that you want to the Optimus Prime to pull the container out at a specific time to a specific location. So that is our shift and our business model essentially is a take rate that we take that is not defined, right? We, to our customers, we just give them a certain rate card. If you are, for example, if you have a thousand boxes, this is how much, you know, for, for 20 right. footer or 40 footer, right? If you have 500 boxes, this is this much, it's dependent on volume as well, right? And then we just basically turn to the other side and we actually procure uh, based on data points that we actually gather Right. If you are good with imports, can I match you with export boxes? If you're good at this location, can I give you more boxes to this location? And this is how we actually monetize and create value. So ultimately, as a, as a company, we are talking about value creation. We, you know, it previously before Holo happens, most of the customers always have to pick up the phone and ask, where is my container? So I think this is one of the problem statements we want to eliminate, right? Instead of picking up the phone to call someone who actually actually doesn't really know because he's not the driver, right? Where the container is, right? He will usually say, wait, let me check and get back to you, right? So our, what we are trying to do is to, to provide that digital platform for anyone to just log into it and you literally can see the truck coming to you. So in the essence, it's a little bit like Uber and Grab, but the, the, the fundamentals behind it, the way it's operating, the operas money uh, behind it is actually different, right? Basically, it, it's a different concept. We just take the best of the innovations that we see, it's a little bit like Airbnb, it's not really. So I think it's, it's easy to just keep up the, the terminology, but we are a technology-enabled trucking company. So that's the core business model of Holio today, right? Okay. But I think let's talk about next stage. Uh, you know, yeah. we, we, we do have a lot of data points on our platform today. We transacted close to 3 million containers in the past five years on our platform, right? Whether or not they are fulfilled mm -hmm. by us, by my own appointed truckers for my customers, which we actually generate revenue, or we actually provide enterprise solutions for the, the moms and pops, the fragmented trucking companies. Well, for those guys who are not in supply chain, supply chain, basically, we have a fundamental belief, right? A supply chain is having a chain of things moving from one point to another point. And we have this common saying in our industry where every in every supply chain, uh, we always believe that the supply chain is only as strong as its weakest link. And guys, the weakest link are unfortunately the truck drivers, the prime movers, the, the, the companies, right? There's so many of them, there are like millions of them in Southeast Asia, right? They are the weakest link today because they are firefighting every day. They have not enough trucks every day. They have operational problem every day and they don't know technology. They're all fragmented. Three trucks, five trucks owners, one truck owner kind of guy. You know, and it's like thousands of them we give them the technology, we give them the tool to succeed, to help them to give, to set a, first and foremost, use technology to set a new standard, right? for them to sort of, I think e-commerce has transformed how things move. If today the, the e-commerce delivery guy does not use the app properly or ask you to sign off when he delivers it, you don't have the, the proof of delivery generated, right? you don't have the milestones and when exactly is he going to arrive. right? So these are all severely, severely lacking. I don't know in your side of the world, in Europe or in the US, but in this part of the world, it's really quite yeah. mafia. That's like, they just use paper, they just pen and write things down. You know, this, everything is offline. So the first step when I tell people, right, you want to talk about digitalization, you talk about AI and, and so ML and all that stuff. Right? Mm -hmm. To me, it's a, it's a bunch of bollocks, right? Not, not, to, not to say that, but I think more importantly is, guys, look at the, the, the if everything is offline, what AI are we talking about? <laughs> <laughs> right, first, exactly. first step guys go back to the fundamentals get all these papers offline to online first step right if they're on excel okay fine right but if you're on excel get right. them out of excel into some kind of a system which in the past these small trucking operators or bosses can never afford right we give them cheap enough solution so our second business model essentially it's an enterprise SaaS model right, right. how do we give, provide software solutions Right, so we are both, people ask me, Elvin, are you on Amazon or you're Spotify? Can't you be both? <laughs> right, so we are a, a, a trucking operator, which we make most of our revenue from today. I think 95% of our revenue is still largely coming from providing trucking as a service. 
And what we do see, the, the enterprise SaaS bit coming up now is 5% today. Uh, I think with digitalization and the tools coming up, you know, companies are more willing to sort of, you know, and back then with COVID, all these restrictions, and come on guys, these truck companies and these drivers don't really know, onboarding has to be done face-to-face. -face. I can't organize like a webinar and say, guys, uh, uncle, can you just download these and then you swipe here? <laughs> no, it doesn't work, man, guys. <laughs> Follow the playbook <laughs> or self-service. <laughs> Yeah, so you got to be there. And I think, you know, we do what works for us, right? And we send young, you know, young folks going down, you know, teaching the uncles, ideally prettier ladies, you know, going down to the ground, right? You know, go to the port depots, you know, teach them how to use the application. And, and these are things that we finally are able to do now, I think with, with the world sort of unlocking. And uh, yeah, this is what we do. So this is the second business model. Obviously, when we reach a certain scale, people talk about super app and stuff. Yeah, I think that, that is a big vision. You know, how do we have financing, you know, trade and you know, insurance? And you know, these are all things that naturally will come. But I think as a, as a founder myself, I, I think that, that only happens when you reach a certain scale. So focus on doing what you need to do first. And I think the rest will fall in place. So I think like, I don't have to touch those like trade financing and all that. These are all things that you, I know for sure you can make money off from. So that is the, the business model of how Holio function. But we want to do it, making sure that we do something really right very well. I think Uber did absolutely something very well, right? They solved a, a, a main problem of being able to help somebody move from one point to another point in a very you know, seamless and a new manner. And, and it's this disruption of the business model that, that comes into the picture. So for us, it's the exact same thing. Focus on making sure that we can hold these containers from point to point in a very seamless manner that, that no one has any fuss. You have to pick up the phone, where's the container? You know, I have these manual issues. The truck driver don't know where I see and where to park and all these kind of operational things. I think technology can play a big role and that's really what we are trying to enforce in South Asia. Uh, I think that's that's great advice there, and we also need to understand the maturity of the sector that we are playing in. So some of those sectors needs to go in in into another layer of technology <laughs> if we want to create innovation. But some of them really need the exactly. basics, and if we start to doing too much at the same time, well, if if I use an, yeah, if I use another analogy, right? Sometimes I tell my co-founder as well. I mean, they love. I mean, my co-founder, he's really like, to him, Apple is like, you know, he really has this philosophy for product philosophy. I really love Apple. You know, we want to make the best product for our guys. But I told him, guys, 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 our industry, right, they, it's like they are actually riding, okay, they are, they are not riding a horse per se. I mean, some of them might be on a horse, huh, actually. You just need to give them a car. A car that has four wheels and a tire that has an engine, that is good enough. But some of them, if they are on XL, they could be on a smaller car. Right. They don't, guys, they don't need a Ferrari. Not today. You give them a Ferrari, they don't know how to drive. <laughs> right. so just, give them a, you just give them a slightly nicer car that can go a little bit faster. And then we do step by step. Right. And I think ultimately our, our grand vision is I think if we become one of the first in Southeast Asia to be a real technology player where we are able to create that kind of value, right? A digital platform, and then we can then position ourselves to be the Ferraris of the industry. But one step at a time because the industry if you give them straight off Ferrari they might not want to pay for it right so I mean unfortunately trucking I mean moving things and, and supply chain I mean even Grab or Uber they're in a the business of mobility those are commoditized business right I mean it doesn't really matter right Mike, whether is it a, 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 a myself or the other guy who picks you up and bring you from this place to another place right can the car fly if the car can fly maybe you pay more right but for me I just wanted the cheapest option that brings me from point to point and exactly transportation of containers is the same thing. So through Holio, we are exactly actually trying to decommoditize a commoditized business using technology as an enabler. So if you think about it from that lens, right, it's really going back to the fundamentals of value creation. That, in my humble opinion, guys, is one of the most important things that founders must always remember. What problem are you solving? And then if you are solving that problem, how is your solution adding value back to the, to the users, whether it's on the customer side or the trucker side? You know, and I always tell my team as well, right? if ever my, my customers or my truckers don't see the value, they see you as another middleman. Right? I don't blame them. And I say that, guys, go back to the drawing board. Right? What are we doing not right for them to feel that way, that you're just another middleman? That means you're not creating sufficient value 
for them to actually want to even pay the extra. I mean, guys, if let's say a container is on my platform, customer pays me $100, maybe I only take $3. I pass the rest of the $97 to my vendors, right? Why is my vendor complaining about that $3 that they are giving up to me and, and not appreciating $97 that I'm giving to them? Right? Why are they looking at that from that lens? Right? That means they don't see the value of giving that $3 to you as a platform. Right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Go back to the drawing board, right? And, and today is $3. It could be $30 the next day. So more importantly, if you are able to create value to the customers and the users, naturally, they will be willing to part that $3 or, or X dollars to you. Right? I think that's the important thing in terms of alignment and positioning in terms of what we stand for as a business. So if we can't even get that right, right go back to the drawing board. Right? Is the problem painful enough for them to willing to part that three dollars to you, and obviously, if they are feeling that way, it means that it's not painful enough, right? And how can you address other aspects of their pain circulating around their business today, right? Is the technology good to have? It might be, right? They will tell you, man, Elvin, I've been doing this business for the last twenty years. It's the same thing, you know. I don't have to change anything. My customers still paying me. You know, but my question back to them is like, do you think you will still stay relevant in the next couple of years? Customers today are requesting for, for visibility. Mm -hmm. Can you offer them that? Right? It becomes an industry standard. So our pitch to them is that if you don't come onto this wave, you might lose the you might even lose the entire $97, guys. Okay, or hundred dollars. Right. If you're not gonna give me the three dollars, you might lose the entire hundred dollars, guys. You know, because this is the customer shift, right? If you are not shifting fast enough to what the customers want, ultimately, customers is king, right? They, they are the ones that determine who and what they're going to pay for. And if, if you're asking me today, would I ever go down to the roads to flag a cab? I probably won't again. Like, I mean, Uber or Grab has sort of transformed that. I can just wait in my office. Oh, I know when is it going to come. It's going to arrive 10 minutes later. I can still, you know, go for a path or have a coffee, no, and then I go down just nice, he arrives. So that, that, that customer experience right, is something that once you create, they would never go back. And that's the same philosophy that we adopt as a company and something that we want to do as well for our customers. And sometimes, guys, customers don't know what they want. Right? I mean, Apple has that philosophy, right? Like, yeah. like, I mean, that is a different philosophy that we can debate on as well again. But I have that conclusion with my founder is that they, we really don't need a Ferrari today, guys. Just, just give them a car that works. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Great, great insights. And especially, I, I think that it seems super simple that when we start preparing the, the deck uh, to go that those slides of the problem solution, uh, and it seems so, so simple, but they are it so is. complex. Uh, and especially spending much more time on the problem than on, on the solution. Uh, yeah. as you just said right uh, making sure that we are addressing the painest uh, part yeah of, the most of, painful part the most yeah. painful part of the um, of the problem uh, i think that's that's definitely great advice and um jumping here into the fundraising lessons that you have been learning uh, until you raised the, the series a uh, round last time of course VCs also want to be an excitement side on in terms of tech to scale up the business and to deliver value to, to customers. Mm -hmm. And some of them might be a little bit scared that the business is still on a tech enabled stage without uh, too much differentiation in terms of uh, technology. Mm -hmm. So I, I know that some of them are able to, to see your vision and to see that we we need to go step by step and that's why there is so much opportunity in this sector is because there is not so much competition our competition are the traditional players the not exactly. The, exactly 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 so and and that's why those unsexy industries as you called it, them uh, <laughs> are where the majority of the opportunities lie uh, nowadays not so much yep. the the sexy uh, industries and um, so what were some of your lessons speaking with investors, educating them, getting educated mm. by them? So really creating a partnership because of course you are the one who knows more about your industry exactly. and they are not, and they are the, the ones who know more about the industry. And you need to come together and believe together that you are able to, to solve yep. a big problem and create a big company by solving that problem. 
Yeah, yeah exactly right. And I think like uh, access to capital, you know, I feel it's it's a it's a necessary evil. Right? I mean, if you talk about making a huge change in a very traditional business, someone has to pay for the price, right? And I think that's where you know, well, the the the, the thesis is that not every business has to be venture backable, right? You, you yep. could run a, a simple small business and you are happy. No, but I think for us, obviously the problem is big enough. I think I've already illustrated that. For, for VCs that I've dealt with, one, one of the biggest pain points that I had was exactly what, what you have mentioned. I think education, right? In this part of the world, um, I mean, if it, I mean it, it could be also, you know, I'm, I'm also learning. I think there's a lot of things that how do I, how do I simplify my business without having to go too deep? A lot of things that I've shared today were, were through years of, of roughening and you know like a diamond is just sort of sharpening right. my, my, my tools and, and how am I supposed to just be concise about the problem statement what am I trying to do yeah. right, how big the problem is this and I think it was difficult because uh, but the best thing that I felt happened was that uh, you know on a, a lighter side on a lighter note was that two years ago there's this big ass ship that was stuck in Swiss Canal yep. remember the, the green ship yes. <laughs> yep. and ever Definitely. since then yeah, people actually know what I'm doing. <laughs> and I think, uh, you know, True. COVID, because because COVID made shipping such a huge thing, right? I mean, the shipping lines were making massive amount of money, right? And, and I think VCs go to where the money goes to, I guess. So so shipping, you know, in a global trade became a huge topic. People are talking about increased freight rates. You're talking about inflation today. People yeah. understand the importance of global supply chain. Yep. And like I said, like I said earlier, 90% of trade is on these ships. <laughs> and how are these ships, the moment the containers arrive in the ports, what happens? The trucks have to pick them up, right? So, so it, it became yep. clearer to them what problem I'm actually solving. And I think a lot of the strikes that have happened, I think in Canada, and then now we have think, this strike in, in Korea, you know, the truck drivers are, are yep. striking because of inflation, because of the diesel prices. Guys, this is a problem I'm solving. <laughs> which you probably didn't know before that and i think now the, the 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 basically the media puts it on the world stage and it's easier for me but guys when i first started in 2017 i actually had to buy a toy truck i used a plasticine to make a container model and a, and a, and a, and a, and a toy model and i had to show the investors like See, have you seen this before? So I was like running that toy uh, around and show them that oh, wow. you see a container. I had to let them visualize it. And you know, the funny thing is that some of them might actually ask me this question, uh, does the container belong to the truck? And at the moment they asked me that question, I was like, hmm, okay, so obviously you don't know the business very well. Uh, the container actually belongs to the shipping lines. So you think of the containers as like boxes that the shipping line, the ship owners actually own and they lease it out for companies to put cargo into the box and to move from one point mm -hmm. to another point, right? So drage and haulage, so in, the, in your part of the world, in, in Europe and in, the, in America, they actually call this term drage. So D-R-A-Y-A-G-E. In my part of the world, in Asia, it's mostly haulage. So hence for haulage drage, it's a bit different. But I mean, trucking in general for generic people, not from the industry, a truck is a truck, right? right. <laughs> How different is a truck, right? But, but for us, we have a six-wheeler, a 10-tonner, you know, an 18-wheeler, we have a side canvas, we have a platform trailer. I mean, you can go technical, right? So it's very right. different. And I think the, 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 the message that I'm sending to a lot of the, the BCs is that haulage is, is, is peculiar. Is unique because it's actually dealing with international freight guys. We deal with ports, we deal with customs, right? Because you need to clear customs, you need to make sure that the custom process is done properly. You do shipping lines, right? And, and, and these ships delay, right? I mean, if you guys take planes, how often does the plane delay? Not many, not much, right? But in, in, in this world, it's very common for vessels to be delayed. For right. all the reasons, right? I mean, typhoon, last time was mostly typhoon. Now it's Shanghai lockdown. A little, if you think about supply chain, right? So long as there's a choke point, everything yeah. becomes urgent, you know? At like, because you're supposed to expect 10 containers to arrive, but the, the vessel yeah. delay, right? And everything ends up being a choke point and everything becomes urgent and everything downstream becomes massively chaotic, right? When, when chaos happens, right? I see opportunity. Right, where most people see chaos, right? I see opportunity to, to sort of orchestrate. <laughs> How do we orchestrate this using technology? Right. And, and that has been my really biggest challenge of trying to explain this in a more easy way, right? in an easier way for people to understand. Yeah. I, think, I, think, I think now it's a lot easier. It makes sense because people understand shipping. They understand 
you know, globalization, right. they see the ship being stuck, they know a container now. You know, so I think that has helped me over the years. But I think um, well, I think COVID has seen a lot of a rise in e-commerce and many of these uh, technology startups as well. Uh, I mean, Flexport, people know Flexport, right? Uh, yeah. Flexport has done tremendously well. You know, sometimes for lack of better word, I tell people we are like Flexport of Southeast Asia, you know, just to give them like, this is what we do. <laughs> One line right. is snippet, right? You know, so, so we are kind of like that, but something different, but essentially that's yeah. the vision. We, we really want to orchestrate global trade for Southeast Asia. And today, guys, we are actually entering from the seaports, but uh, we actually have plans for rail, for, for intermodal, basically like an intermodal digital play because cross-border, if you look at ASEAN, right, 10 countries, a big block of them on the left, eight of them on the left side connecting mm -hmm. China down to Europe actually by rail. So containers is just the first aspect for Hollywood. Right. We, I do have some VCs challenging me that, you know, yeah, Elvin, your containers is, is, is the 10 is kind of like small, you know, but, you know, 100 million containers, yeah, could be small, right? 10 is really up to your own definition, right? right. But <laughs> the other right side of Southeast Asia is made up of Indonesia and Philippines, which are, interestingly, guys, lots of islands. When there's lots of islands, how do you get to the island? You need to use a ship, a small little sampan or some little small barges to send containers. So yeah. the domestic shipping itself over there is massive, right? So for us, so long as you want to move a container in Southeast Asia, you think of Hollywood. So that's really what our ambition is. And I think it's what we are trying to illustrate, right? Honestly speaking, my fundraising journey, my cap table is made up of a lot more strategic investors than VCs, unfortunately, right? A shout out to the VCs now, if you're interested in this space, you know, institutional ones, because we actually want to find, to balance, counterbalance, I have too many strategic. Like the funny thing is that most startups go through financial institutions before strategic comes in. Right. Mine is strategic first, because right. I don't have to explain much to the owner of the shipping line. I don't have to explain too much to the, the right. freight forwarders. I don't have to explain much to the port operators because, the they, yeah. because they feel the problem every day, guys. Right. right. It's something that they can see. Right? But it's hard for me to explain. And, and, and I mean, don't get me wrong. I mean, a lot of VCs, fantastic VCs have passed on on us. And I don't blame them. It's simply because they can't, if you don't know the problem, you probably won't invest. Yeah. And I think, right. I, and, and we were obviously only in Singapore back then. So I think now we are proving our capabilities that we are able to do it outside of the Singapore market, in Thailand, yeah. in Indonesia. You know, we are expanding really quickly to the rest of them. We have a certain playbook that we have demonstrated that we are able to execute. I think now the rest is just seeing how we actually do it. Got it. That, that's a great point. And how did you see your, your deck evolving? Because we can see that you are always improving the way yeah. you define the problem, the, the way you articulate the problem, uh, the solution, the term, you were even talking about the term, the why now, you also talking a lot about that yep. side during this conversation. Uh, of course, the go-to-market strategy uh, slide, what, what markets to attack in what, in what order, et cetera, et cetera. So we can see that we are always working on the same deck because people think that we just work on the deck and it's done. Uh, no, 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 that's no, not never the case. Always, 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 <laughs> always improving changing. the deck, right? Yeah, and, and I think like, sometimes, the hmm, majority of the time, ahead. the deck is not even, uh, the deck is a tool to articulate our story yes. and to be able... Uh, exactly. Don't be so hard up on the deck. I mean, I think the best founders can pitch without a deck, right? But the deck is there for them to visualize. I mean, I, I mean, I can, I'm kind of like pitching now, right? But I'm trying to articulate. Yeah. But if you have a deck for people to actually see and articulate you know, visually, people are visual creatures, right? How do you then yeah. express through your deck the, the, the narrative that you are basically trying to tell them. I think fundraising, there is a certain template I mean, for founders out there who have done it before. You know yeah. what they are looking out for. It's just storytelling, but a lot goes, a lot of the work happens after the deck, Excellent. right? What's the unit economics like? You know, I think for us now, from an A to a B company, you know, there are other things that they're looking out for. Yeah. You can't lump everything into the deck, right? So I think, yeah. you know, I mean, deck is a deck, right? I've seen beautiful decks. I think yeah. really beautiful ones. And I think it depends on which stage of the company you're at. Like for the right. series CD guys, they actually engage professionals to build the deck for them. Yeah. And so it's different. Right? So I think, I think as, a, as, a, yeah. as a founder, you gotta, you gotta understand that. I think like in every stage of the journey of a startup, 
or scale up for that matter, right? You have to yep. deploy. It's not a one rule fit all kind of a thing. Fully, fully agreed. Uh, and it's it's really important, as you said, to use your Legos to to build the story and to make it easier for people to, yeah. to understand. Yeah. And 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 for the different stakeholders in the business, for the investors, for the customers, for the talent yeah. that you need to attract, it's it's yeah. really yeah. Uh, you need all those stakeholders to build a a great business, well, and you need to have a, a pitch deck for all of them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You have to say different narrative to different stakeholders, right? Right. If I were to pitch to a trucking company, I can't really tell them the full vision because they'll run away. <laughs> they'll feel so scared that they run away, right? So, so I think for founders, right, we are always sort of selling ourselves. Like, you know, every single day I'm I'm storytelling to some degree, whether is it to this stakeholder. If it's internal, it's also, you know, setting up the culture. How do you, you know, how do you make them want to be a part of this mission? You know, guys, we as founders, guys, we only have a dream. That's all we have, right? We have a vision, we have a dream, and then you have people here wanting to build a dream together with you, right? And then like, you know, I always tell people, right, that is my biggest motivation because we really just have a dream and we can, we, our success is really determined by our stakeholders. I'm very blessed to have investors who have trusted me with their money, you know, and, and more importantly, it's my people, right? And these are things that keeps me going every single day. Love it. Uh, and it's incredible how time uh, flies. Uh, and <laughs> I still have the last segment that we didn't discuss: sure. uh, recruiting no and culture and so many things to talk about. So many things, <laughs> but it's it's really impossible. And I'm getting, uh, I'm, I'm I'm understanding show after show that we really need to focus in in, in certain topics because it's impossible. I can always come back, Mike. Exactly. I can always come back. Yeah, exactly. no problem. Let, anytime, let's, anytime. let's do a second. Uh, yeah. Episode. Okay. Happy to do that. Sure. But uh, but before let, let me also go through the um, the format that we run at the end of the show, which is a quick uh, question and a quick answer. Okay. So let's try to be okay. brief. Yeah, let's on, do that. Okay, I will that. do that. Yeah. So uh, if you would have the opportunity to have a coffee uh, or tea with yourself at the beginning of all you, what advice would you offer to your younger self? Uh, stay true to yourself. Right, I think there are a lot of times where you can get. I mean, the media hype and all, you know, the media like to hype a lot of founders. Just stay true to yourself. Always remember to stay humble and, and, and be true to yourself. Great one. What are you the most proud of uh, during your journey um, so far? My stakeholders. I think having them to be a part of this journey, believing in this, I mean, I'm just two, myself and my co-founders, just two young boys try to have a dream. And I think we have now progressed a lot further than making it a dream. And I think that's really one of my proudest things. Like having a chance to sort of try to transform this industry is one of my proudest things that I've done. Worst advice ever received? <laughs> Take my money. <laughs> <laughs> Good one. And, and now resources. What, what is your favorite book? Oh, I, 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 I read a lot of, um, you know, in Chinese, we call Sun Tzu Bing Fa. It's uh, Shun Tzu, uh, War, yeah. Art of War. I think I, I really appreciate exactly. that. Um, it's the art of doing, doing business, like, like trying to understand business ethics, like how do people think, like how do you actually work with people. At the end of the day, I think any sort of business is really about the people, right? I think that's really the, 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 the way I, I see it. And that's the, something that I've been reading a lot recently. Love it. Favorite movie or series, uh, as you wish? Uh, <laughs> I'm a big Marvel fan, so I, I guess the recent one was the, the Doctor Strange. It was really nice. I've not watched Top Gun, by the way. I think that I heard so much good review about uh, you know, Tom Cruise. Big fan of him as well. <laughs> and, and finally, your favorite podcast, excluding this one. <laughs> um... Honestly speaking, I don't listen to that many podcasts. Uh, right. Yeah, I don't really right. listen to that many yeah. podcasts. So I'm new to this. And I think that I, I think, uh, you know, recently I've been trying to listen to more when I'm on the planes because I've been traveling a lot as well. So I download them and I listen. Uh, mostly yeah, on uh, men, men, mental health, guys. I think it's really, on. I've been reading about more on like, how do I be better mental health? Um, yeah, as a founder, I think it's, it's really important to have that emotional support. Like, like I'm, I'm thankful. I have a family. I have a, I have a, I have a lovely wife, who really has been there, you know, for me, true and true. 
but you really need somebody to be your sounding board. I think mental mental wellness. I've been I can't remember the name of the podcast, but I've been listening to some of those just to you know kind of this, that, that, that zen. You know, we have like founders. We have like thousands and one things to do every single day. How do you right. remain zen and, and and tell yourself that you know you know you can always be a better version of yourself. It's okay to make mistakes. You know, just live with it, move on. Just be a better version of yourself every day. Don't compare yourself with someone else. You know, just just remain focused. But these are things that I I. Uh, try to keep myself mentally sound sometimes. <laughs> very, very good sentences. I was even writing them down as, as you were. Thank you. As you were Thank speaking. You. Yeah. Uh, very good sentences on. Uh, and it helps sometimes to just have those sentences in front of me, in front of us, in in the phone or whatever it is. To yeah, keeps you them. constantly reminded and grounded. I think that's really important. Surround yourself with people who you know will remain true to yourself. I mean, like there will be many different people that you see that might lead you astray, that might make you think otherwise, but always ask yourself, why are you doing this? And then, you know, just stay true to yourself. Don't, don't change because other people want you to change. If you ever want to change, change because you want to change. Right. Great point. Alvin, I really appreciated you uh, sharing yeah, your experience nice. with us. No Thanks so much. For Round two next time. time. <laughs> exactly. You are yeah, more no than problem. invited to, to come yeah, for I'll be back. I'll two. be back. Yeah. Thanks a lot. <laughs> we Mike. also have this, this topic. Thank you, Alvin. And to our community, we keep bringing you the best of the best. And of course, it's promised that also uh, round two with Alvin. So <laughs> Thank you, you so much. See and keep scaling. <laughs>